place. I said bigger four ideas. Oh yes. So, um, is she all right. Sounds good. Where's my third place? Yeah. My hair. Yeah. I looked at the CIS and I looked at my. I'm so glad to see you, John. Oh, on Tuesday, I'm going to have pizza and talk about the offense-defense balance and how if we're living in a defensive-oriented world and what that means for security issues. So we're lucky to have Charlie Glazer. He's going to lead the discussion along with uh, Smith. So looking forward. Conan, who is the vice president, director of policy plans and program at the CNA, Center for Naval Analysis. And he's going to come and talk on the uh, future of special operations. And he was assistant conflict. He also worked on cyber. Protecting Critical Technology Task Force. So if you're interested, look him up online, Joseph Tone and T-O-N-O-N. Try to keep him uh, on the first question. Uh, we can take advantage of him coming. So for, for those, um, so the third thing is the well which is tomorrow night, right?
So generally, we have one dinner, which is a little more casual, in the fall. And then we have a big gala fancy thing in the spring. Except this year, Laura has set up possibly the swankiest welcome dinner we've ever had. <laughs> so uh, we're going to be renting the whole restaurant at the French restaurant over here at Baltifold. And we got not only just like two kinds of beer and, and, you know, white and red wine, we got like bourbon there. And there's not just going to be like chicken or fish, there's going to be beef. This is like, this is uptown. So I also I encourage everybody to not, you know, dress, not dress formally, festively. This is a special welcome dinner. And uh, I'm a very lucky tie probably and a jacket so that's but at the very least don't don't show up looking like a, you know homeless person okay um what do you got a lot of kids coming too right so we got like sparklers for kids and okay coloring books all right okay so let's look Okay, so welcome to the uh, first full session of the MIT Security Studies Program Wednesday uh, seminar series. So my name is Roger Peterson. I am uh, filling in as acting director for Taylor Fravel, who is on a well-deserved uh, leave. And I'm uh, happy to um, present our first speaker, uh, Polina Belyakova who is the um, SSP Paul and Melanie Brophy Fellow for Russia um, uh, Policy. So Dr. Uh, Belyakova received her PhD in International Relations from the Fletcher School at Tufts University, held a po postdoctoral appointment at Dartmouth College Dickey Center for National Understanding, and uh, she's going to be here talking today on her um, book project, Know Thy Military, How Governmental Policies Weaken uh, Civilian Control. So uh, uh, Polina is a scholar of international security focusing on civil military relations and the use of force with regional expertise in Russia and Ukraine. Being a native Ukrainian and, and Russian speaker, she collects data through elite interviews, field work, archival research, and systematic reviews of local media sources, and uses both quantitative and qualitative approaches. So uh, with, that, um, with that introduction, I will turn it over to you, Pauline. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you I noticed that for at least this season, every presentation in the seminar series has the word military in it, and it means that I'm in the correct room. So my presentation is not uh, an exception, actually. And uh, I'm presenting my book project. It's a work of five years. Of course, I cannot present all evidence. That's why I will appreciate your questions at the end of the talk. My motivation for this research is professional, but also very personal. In 2014, when the Russian aggression against Ukraine started, I was in Israel studying counterterrorism, a discipline I expected to never be of any use in Ukraine. To my surprise, the Ukrainian government decided to launch a, an anti-terrorist operation in eastern Ukraine to prevent the takeover of Ukrainian cities. And Ukrainian troops started to move. To my surprise, on multiple occasions, the mightiest tool of statecraft, military force, could not protect the cities in my country from people who looked like this, lightly armed individuals, no particular uniform, and uh, no armored vehicles at the beginning. Also, on multiple occasions, the Ukrainian military surrendered to people who looked like this. It's a bunch of civilians. They did not only surrender, they gave up their heavy equipment, 
and left. And that equipment was later used against the Ukrainian military in exactly the locations where they refused to take and implement the orders. Two things made me puzzled. First, it was nothing like anti-terrorism that I was studying in Israel at all. And also, why did Ukrainian military fail to implement the order? And the usual intuition, of course, is to say there is something wrong with the military. But the theories of civil military relations, when talk about something being wrong with the military, usually talks about power-hungry military that wants more autonomy, less civilian meddlement in their affairs. But it was not the case of Ukrainian apolitical and coup-averse military at the time. To summarize the intuition of my research, I will bring you to probably some of you to the childhood memories of reading The Little Prince. And if as a child you read The Little Prince and did not notice a civil military relation theme there, well, reread it. Because there is an important quote. One of the characters is asking The Little Prince, if I ordered a general to fly from one flower to another like a butterfly, and if the general did not carry out the order, which one of us would be in the wrong? And the intuition of and to understand exupery and my research that I conducted for five years in four languages, in four cases, come to the same answer. And to understand exupery probably knew something as an airman. Um, and the answer is it would be the government's fault. It would be the government's fault because it's the government responsibility to simply know their military and to give orders that fall within the military's profession. And that's, in brief, what my book is about. So if your phone buzzes and you have to leave, that's it, that's the gist. But let's get into details. Civil military relations sometimes is perceived as a niche topic in security studies, and even not every department that claims to study international relations offers a class on civil military relations. I know that this program is an exclusion, but still. And that's a surprise because civil military relations are constantly in the news. So for example, foreign policy asks uh, questions about Putin's fears of strong generals and whether it's a new phenomenon or it's as old as Russia itself. Uh, Russia today have their own reasons to speculate that Zelensky is at odds with top general, meaning of course, Valery Zaluzhny. Financial Times is asking, where is the next African coup? And the Wall Street Journal is concerned that the protest by the Israeli reservists uh, is putting Israel at risk of threat from Iran and Hezbollah. And all these questions, they are essentially about civilian control of the military. Can civilians control their militaries? And we indeed should care about civilian control. I know that this crowd probably does not need convincing, but I'm so used to convincing people that we should care, so just let me do this, please. So we, we studied the use of force a lot. And from the smart books that we read, we know that the use of force has to be somehow tied to higher policy. Otherwise, it's just the way of breaking things. And that's civilian control. That's what it does. It ties together policy and the use of force. But there is an interesting bias when we talk about this relationship. Empirical research mostly covers how people who look like this can weaken civilian control, how the military can weaken civilian control, and how the people who are responsible for the use of force essentially can do it. If you happen to recognize anyone in these pictures, um, that's not uh, an accident. Um, my research talks directly to this side, how people who look like this, people who formulate policy, can also unintentionally weaken civilian control. And you would be like, Polina, but why would they? They are interested in controlling the military. That's true, but my book is that unintentionally, and it happens exactly when governments fail to know their militaries. So the central question of my book project is when and why governmental policies about the use of force erode civilian control of the military. That's a mouthful. We're in academia. I'm very aware of that. But let me help you with the last part because it's very important. To answer this question, we have to answer what does it mean to erode civilian control of the military. To answer that question, I come up with a comprehensive framework of erosion of civilian control. And my motivation for that is the following. Uh, 
often when I start conversations about erosion of civilian control, people go like, oh, you study coups. And if we think about coups exclusively, it gives a false sense of security to policymakers in states like the United States or the United Kingdom, where coups are not common, because they're not common in democracies. And they think that coups are the problems of uh, young African regimes or the Latin American regimes of the Cold War, for example. And my framework helps to shed light on other forms of erosion of civilian control more relevant to democracies. So there's a common point of agreement in civil military relations literature that civilian control is a power balance. And if it is a power balance, we can model it like this as a gradient where the bluish part stands for civilian and red that you can barely see now uh, would stand for the military power in this relationship. And there are three power dynamics that I argue can happen to this power balance. And first is insubordination. The military can deny the civilian exercise of power by saying no to what it's asked to perform. Um, some examples might include desertion, resignation, refusal to take or give orders. The second power dynamics is competition. The military can uh, give press statements or participate in election or undermine the governmental policy in ways other than coups to shape policy that they don't like. And I call it erosion by competition. And the third power dynamics, the least studied and the most dangerous in democracies, I would argue, is power delegation or what I call erosion by deference, when civilians voluntarily give power to the military to run policy. For example, letting the military to formulate policy, run negotiations, or become the public face of policy. I have two peer-reviewed publications on this if you're interested in this framework specifically. One is at Comparative Political Studies and uh, another at Texas National Security Review that talks specifically about deference in the case of the United St States under Trump. I rely on this framework in my book to code the dependent variable, erosion of civilian control. So now when we look at the research question that we saw before, when and why governmental policies about the use of force erode civilian control of the military, we understand that we're talking about how policy effects can lead to these three forms of erosion. But of course there is a black box that has to be unpacked between these two causes and effects. And if we could really look into that box, like physically open it, we would see some important ingredients that have to be included into this new theory that would tie policy and erosion of civilian control. And to students of civil military relations, that would not be news. It has to do something with preference divergence, because when military and civilians have different preferences, the military tends to intervene in politics. It also has something probably to do with profession. We know from one very influential book that military professionalism prevents the military from intervening in politics. But we also know from critique on that book that profession sometimes might be a reason why the military intervenes in politics. We also, to explain difference, have to think about what the scholars have to say about who has the right to govern and who has the right to oversee the military. So shaking that black box and putting these ingredients together, I come up with the policy focus theory. In essence, policy about the use of force would lead to these three forms of erosion of civilian control. First, if the government wants the military to fly like a, like a butterfly from one flower to another, or to do things that lie outside of the military's profession. The military not trying to grab more power, but trying to get itself out of implementing these policies would engage either in insubordination or competition. Second, governmental policy maker, making, especially in security issues, can expose the government to political risks. And in practical terms, it might be a coalition breakdown, for example, or public criticism of the policy. And when the government feels this risk, it wants to distance itself from security policy making. And there is no better actor than the military to which the government can defer when it comes to formulating security policies. And that's how erosion by deference happens. So this is, in essence, the policy focus theory. How do I test it? To test it, I look at four cases. First is Russia during the first Chechen war. Uh, 
Second is Ukraine at the beginning of the war in Donbass in 2014. Third is Israel in the first Palestinian Intifada. And the fourth one is the United Kingdom in Northern Ireland. And you would be Polina, but these are all separatist conflicts. These are all intrastate conflicts. So maybe your theory applies only to intrastate conflicts. I hope I'll be able to convince you that it's not because there is nothing that theoretically limits it to intrastate conflicts. But intrastate separatist conflicts or conflicts that are perceived as such offer a very rich research environment for me to test this theory because often, but not always, they require the military to perform tasks that are against their professional training. And often, but not always, they expose the government to harsh criticism for not being able to solve these problems without the use of military force. And this often, but not always, remark allows me to generate a very useful variation in cases in how they relate to the policy focus theory and alternative explanations to erosions. Uh, so Russia, for example, has both policy focused factors present. The policy is against the military profession. The military did not perceive the war in Chechnya as something the military should solve. And also Yeltsin was facing harsh criticism for using the military in Chechnya, both domestically and internationally. So he had incentives to defer to the military and distance himself from policy making. And someone will say, oh, I understand. So Russia is an easy case for your theory. And I would argue no. Because in Russia, there were also so many alternative explanations to erosion to, of civilian control, weak democratic institutions, volatile civil society, uncertain future of the military institution, and also poor economic performance of the government. So in Russia, there is nothing easy about this case. I have to disentangle the policy focused explanations from the alternatives, and I have to admit I did not succeed in 100% of cases. Sometimes it's just impossible. That's why I need to look at other cases. In Ukraine, there is an interesting variation. The policy at first was perceived by the military. When the government sent the military to fight in Donbass, the military said, oh, whoa, whoa, it's not our job. We were not trained for that. But later in the process, the threat manifested differently. The military recognized that on the other side there are actually conventional forces and started to perform its duty uh, without any erosion of civilian control. Uh, in terms of uh, exposing policymaker, policymakers to political risks, Ukraine was not a very risky case. Actually, Ukrainian government benefited from posing itself as a wartime government. So I don't expect any deference to happen there. In Israel, the policy was against the military profession. And you would say, wait, Polina, we're in 1987, the first intifada starts. And the IDF is enforcing the occupation for 20 years. So how is it suppressing and uprising by Palestinians in the occupied territories is not part of the military profession. But if we look deep into the documents of the time, we find that the IDF thought that it's profession, the core of its profession, is to protect Israel from conventional threats by conventional means. And one of the reasons is that exactly at that time, late 90s, uh, late 80s, early 90s, the Soviet Union, Union collapsed and the geopolitical environment in the Middle East was changing. So the IDF wanted to focus on the countries outside of Israel, Israel rather than putting down the rebellion inside of Israel. And uh, the United Kingdom. I call it a sterile case because it's a strong democracy with almost non alternative explanations for erosion except policy focused ones. However, the British military did not recognize this conflict as a threat to its profession. It actually saw continuity between uh, previous colonial counterinsurgency campaigns and this deployment. But uh, the security policy making exposed the British government to political risks. We will discuss them in detail later. So this variation allows me to test the utility of my theory under different conditions. And now when you select cases, you know what happens next. You have to gather evidence. Over the five years, I traveled to Russia and Ukraine. I interviewed people. I interviewed people online because part of this research was uh, during COVID. Uh, in, you can see a picture of me with uh, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, and uh, it's a, 
snapshot from uh, a Russian archive, and I had a joke about that particular archive that wherever you sit, you see at least one Lenin. Like that's the policy of the place. Uh, so um, in Ukraine, I mostly relied on interviews because there are no archives at the time. The conflict is still ongoing. And I was able to interview the former commander of the anti-terrorism operation, hero of Ukraine, General Mikhailo Zabrotsky. I also interviewed the first Zelensky national security advisor, uh, Pan Demeluk. And I also interviewed the pro-governmental militia battalions, as they used to be called in the past. And in the center, you see a picture of Yana Zinkevich. She is the commander of one of the pro-governmental battalions fought in Ukraine, and um, they're fighting even now. In every case, I had to bottle the hindsight bias. Because when you ask people about the first intifada, they say talking to you about the second one. The same with the first and second Chechen war. The same even with differences in perception of what's going on in Ukraine. That's why I analyzed thousands of media entries contemporary to the events that I was reading, and also hundreds of governmental documents. Uh, also, if you read my book Project Draft, you will see that most of the sources on Israel come from the 90s. So I brought some books just to show you that, for example, a book on civilian control of the military in Russia is dated 1999. So I really had to dig deep to find the sources that are not necessarily best researched, but they reflect the contemporary thinking about what's going on. The same here about the Intifada and the uh, uh, war in Northern Ireland. So how this evidence aligns with what's going on. Just a reminder, my theory predicts that when policies challenge the military profession, it leads to insubordination. Here is the story about Russia from 1994. In early December, Yeltsin approved the use of force in Chechnya. And the troops started moving towards Grozny, the capital of Chechnya. But one of the commanders refused to implement order. Why? He was faced by local civilians saying that they oppose the use of force and they are against the war and he tried to solve the problem by negotiating with them. He also reached to his superiors and asked, uh, what should I do? There is a group of civilians, mostly women, blocking my way. And the order was proceed anyway. Of course, he refused to do it, but why? The important question is why. I was able to recover an archival footage of this encounter. That's a huge luck for a researcher. And uh, it's a lengthy exchange, but in essence, the woman is asking the general, what if you're ordered to advance? And he responds to her in a perfect military manner. He says, tanks can't advance on people. Our military regulations prohibit that. He does not say that it's immoral even illegal, he says our military regulations prohibit that. And it's not a single case. At least two more prominent generals refused to command the operation at the beginning of the war. They explicitly said that the Russian military was not trained to do these kind of jobs. They referred to their profession directly. Insubordination became a major issue in uh, this war. Uh, in the archival documents, I was able to recover in Russia, have the print out here. If you want to hear more about stories, how to get documents from Russia, we can talk about it in the Q&A. But I was lucky to get these. And I learned that about 3,000 soldiers refused to take orders. Of course, they were not interviewed on spot about why did you refuse to implement orders. But luckily, the RA service from 1995, so it's the first year of the war, uh, asking uh, military officers, would they, uh, under what conditions would they refuse to implement orders? And 39% of them claim that if the order pertains to suppressing a separatist movement inside, inside of Russia, they would refuse to follow this order. And the situation was not unique to Russia. 20 years later in Ukraine, this explains my initial puzzle. When the Ukrainian government approved the use of force in Donbass, it called the operation anti-terrorist operation. Ukrainian military was not trained to do anti-terrorism. Uh, when journalists who took this picture asked the soldiers why are they giving up their uh, vehicles and retreating, uh, they explained no one prepared us to fight against civilians in the cities. 
I was skeptical about this response, so I asked the former commander of the anti-terrorist operation, General Zabrotsky, about this. I was like, but Ukrainian military was deployed in Iraq and also fought in the former Yugoslavia, and uh, maybe there are people in the room who actually had a practical experience of fighting together with the Ukrainian soldiers in peacekeeping mis missions. And he told me those experiences, they have never been institutionalized. Even though Ukrainian, some Ukrainian soldiers fought against non-state actors, it was peacekeeping missions and they never became part of the Ukrainian military profession as such. Several generals also refused to command troops at the beginning of the war, and they gave, gave a very explicit explanation for that. They said the military will not fight against its own people, which also strictly lies outside of the boundaries of the military profession. It took some time for the Ukrainian military and government to recognize the threat as not being an intrastate separatist conflict, but actually a Russian aggression against Ukraine. But you might ask, okay, so you presented like on two post-Soviet militaries, maybe they're just insubordinate, maybe there are some Soviet legacies that drive them to say no. And I hope that some of those who are laughing now had this question in their notes. So I will not dive deep into details, but just believe me that in Israel during 1987, the soldiers were facing exactly the same problem and also selective refusal to serve specifically in the occupied territories became unprecedented. So the number of draft dodgers raised and when they explained why they don't want to join the service specifically in the occupied territories, the soldiers said, we refuse to participate in suppressing the uprising. This is not a war, this is an oppression, implying that the military should fight a war, not conduct oppression. And it's not the way the IDF resolves problems. Interestingly, soldiers in Israel prefer to be deployed on the border with Lebanon, a much more dangerous location than dispersed protests of Palestinian civilians in the occupied territories. So sometimes when civilian policies challenge the military profession, it also results in competition. I will give you just one example from Israel, but we can talk about more examples from Russia, because it happened in Russia and in Ukraine too, uh, in the Q&A. So in Israel, uh, as soon as the Intifada started, prominent military officers recognized it as preventing the IDF from preparing to real security threats the IDF should be concerned about in their point of view. And the patriarch of the Israeli military intelligence general, at that time retired, Aaron Yariv, he founded a civil society organization, a political organization called Council on Peace and Security. And the heart of the agenda of this organization was to uh, convince the Israeli public that Intifada erodes the idea of strength. This is case of competition because it casts shadow of doubt on the governmental policy, which at that time was to crush the Intifada militarily. 36 major generals retired and reserve duty joined the movement. 84 retired brigadiers joined the movement. More than 100 retired IDF colonels joined the movement with the same message. The IDF should not fight the Intifada because it's should be preparing for different kinds of threats. But some of you might ask, okay, it's Israel. I mean, anyone who knows anything about Israel would say Israeli military is constantly involved in Israeli politics. What's new about that? There was something new in 1988. And it's that, that for the, almost the first time in history, at least the first time at this scale, the Israeli military sided with the opposition and not the government. The norm in Israeli civil military relations was that the military supports the government and not the opposition. But this time the opposition was pro-peace and it promised to get the IDF out of the Intifada. Uh, an example of erosion by competition by an active duty military officer is of course by General Dan Shamron. He was the chief of the general staff of the IDF. It's the highest military rank. But there is a special military rank instituted for this kind of position called Rav Aluf. It's the like, top general, and there is only one top general at a time at Israel. So he's the military officer at the time. And giving a press uh, statement in 1988, he explained what's the problem with the IDF and Intifada. 
He said, in total war, you destroy targets and occupy territory. But here, meaning in the occupied territories, we are the government, and government can't declare war upon its subjects. So he clearly pointed that it's not the military's role here to suppress the uprising. He was not alone. The chief of the military intelligence at the time later leaked a, an assessment to a press stating that it's not the job of the IDF to solve intifada, it's the job of the government. All these acts of erosion by competition, or I call them as erosion by competition, they strive to undermine the government's policy and to say that the, what the government wants us to do is what, not what the military has to do and it's bad for state security. So this kind of behavior is not typical for Israel, at least not at the time. But may, maybe, maybe we're coming back to the interstate conflict issue. Maybe militaries just hate interstate conflict. Maybe they just hate engaging with civilians. And some of you who serve probably would not like, yeah, that's not, not the best part of our job. Um, so the question, is it even possible to deploy the military in an intrastate conflict without facing competition and insubordination? Yes, that's exactly what happened in the United Kingdom. The British military recognized this deployment. They were not correct, by the way, but it doesn't matter. In their point of view, it was another colonial counterinsurgency campaign. One of the interesting pieces of evidence that points at that is that during the counterinsurgency training for colonial counterinsurgency, uh, they practiced a riot dispersion practice that required unrolling a banner in which uh, the warning was written in Arabic, like stop here or we will shoot. So at one, in one occasion they used that banner in Northern Ireland. I, did not, I, I was not uh, able to find a picture of that, but that clearly testifies that the British military actually saw continuity. Again, they were not right because they, actually, they were not actually well prepared for that. But it doesn't matter. You can see in this picture, they are with civilians, children, and there were no acts of insubordination or competition during the first years of the troubles that were of any significance. In my book, I consider 16 instances of insubordination. And policy-focused theory can plausibly explain all of them. But I told you that I cannot rule out all alternative explanations in all cases. For example, in Ukraine, um, the military was actually afraid for their lives when they unexpectedly were facing the Russian military. Uh, weak oversight could explain one of the instances of insubordination in Ukraine. That's an interesting one. You can ask me about that in the Q&A. Similarly with competition, the policy-focused explanation can plausibly explain 12 of them that I consider in the book. Weak institutions could not be ruled out in some instances in Russia and Ukraine because institutions are weak there. And also individual ambitions of the generals, those of you who study Russia would be, yes, like Polina, go rule out the political ambitions of General Lebed. I will look at that. And that's true. That's why I need cases. But overall, policy-focused theory performed the best. Let's talk about deference. My theory predicts that when policies get the government in trouble, government has incentives and does defer to the military. So in Russia in 1994, Yeltsin, even before the beginning of the First Chechen War, wanted to do nothing with solving the crisis. He tried to distance himself from Chechnya as much as possible. He even launched a clandestine kind of military operation to solve the crisis while no one was looking. He failed. And at the beginning of the crisis, he consulted with a number of civilian advisors who gave him policy options. He said no to all of them and dismissed all his civilian advisors. And these policies were wide in their range, but one thing they had in common is that they required Yeltsin to go shake hands, sign documents, and actually become the face of the policy. He did not want that. Instead, he chose a different person to be the face of the policy. It was his of defense, General uh, Pavel Grachov, uh, active duty in the uniform all the time. That's typical for Russia. That's not erosion by deference in itself. For Russia, it's a norm to have a military minister of defense. Uh, however, to do what Grachov then had to do is not typical. Three days before the Russian troops started moving towards Grozny, General Grachov flew to Chechnya and talked to the head of Chechen separatists 
Johar Dudayev, trying to convince him to negotiate a solution for this problem. Of course, Grachev could not make any concessions because he did not have the political power that a civilian leader would have to offer concessions. Uh, there were also two military officers. Uh, Dudayev uh, served in the Soviet military as much as Grachev did. So here they are sitting together three days before the invasion. Grachev did not only have to negotiate with Dudayev, he then was responsible to formulating the policy about the use of force in Chechnya, and at some point even commanded the troops. So the same person was responsible for policy formulation and policy implementation in at least two cases. As I told you, Yeltsin tried to distance himself, as the policy focus theory predicts, from policymaking in Chechnya. This is a scan of the order with which President Yeltsin technically started the first Chechen war. And an interesting part about that order is that it does not have the words war, military, use of force, nothing like this. Instead, Yeltsin ordered to use all means at government's disposal for the provision of state security, lawfulness, other nice things, and the disarmament of all armed formations. So if there is a euphemism Olympics, this is a very strong contender, and it helps to distance Yeltsin from this decision. He said, oh, I, I told you to use all means by government's disposal. Never I told you to crush Chechnya with military force. But maybe Russia is simply a weak democracy with an erratic leader who likes to drink. Maybe. That, that, that's not a wrong statement. But it's not a suitable alternative explanation to deference. Because if there is a strong democracy with a pretty boring leaders usually, it's the United Kingdom. So in the United Kingdom, the government faced harsh criticism both internally and externally, for what's going on in Northern Ireland. And there are two reasons for that. Unlike in colonial counterinsurgencies of the past, uh, the conflict involved the citizens who vote for that very government that sent the troops. That was a new thing for London. And second, I don't know if you can see here or not, but several people are taking pictures of this rather dramatic encounter of a soldier with a man holding a baby. And the media scrutiny and media attention actually put London at risk. And London preferred to distance itself. So it agreed to deploy the British military in Northern Ireland without giving them any policy guidance about what's going on. They just approved the use of force. That's it. On multiple occasions, the general officer commanding the troops in Northern Ireland requested details like, what are we here for? What are we supposed to do? And received none. Of course, as violence escalated, he had to make decisions about how to use force without any policy guidance, and he switched to a familiar, enemy-centric counterinsurgency practices, which increased the number of casualties in Northern Ireland, which involved curfews and detainment without trial. And while the military was beaten by the media for doing all this, the government in London presented itself as a pro-peace, honest broker in this conflict. This behavior is consistent with erosion by deference. So maybe it's not the policy making risks, but simply the lack of civilian expertise. Maybe the government just does not know what to do in this kind of situation. Let me disappoint you. In uh, Russia, Yeltsin did have civilian expertise. I was lucky to interview his advisor on ethnic conflicts, literally the point person to consult Yeltsin on what to do with Chechnya. And uh, Yeltsin's advisor told me that he was very surprised to learn that Yeltsin ordered the use of troops in Chechnya. And this happened while this advisor was on NTV, it was the channel that Russians watched there, on live TV. And he was asked, like, what do you think about Yeltsin ordering the beginning of the war in Chechnya? And he was like, what? We were consulting on completely different options. So no, the lack of civilian expertise does not explain that. Also, in Ukraine, governmental policies did not challenge the government at all. Again, government, different Ukrainian politicians, they actually benefited from being the wartime politicians. For example, President Petro Poroshenko started to pose in military uniform, socialize with the military, visiting troops in the front lines. And the same, you see a picture of a very young President Zelensky, just a reminder of what he looked at the beginning of this show. So he also posed with the military, visited the troops, and portrayed himself as a wartime president. 
no notable instances of erosion by deference happened in Ukraine at the beginning of the conflict and later on. I consider nine cases of deference and policy-focused explanation that I call avoiding responsibility and the one that I presented here explains seven out of nine. Alternative explanations can explain some of them, especially in Israel. Civil military relations are very peculiar, so it's difficult to separate them from one another. But yes, in some cases, the lack of expertise drove Israeli deference to the military. But in other cases, policy-focused theory performed best. So what are the main findings, trying to summarize it? First, that governmental policy can erode civilian control. We have to take it seriously. Governments should stop being so relaxed about formula formulating security policies without asking about the potential backlash from their troops. Second is that erosion of civilian control is an overlooked unintended consequence of the use of force. Third is that governments at local risk, they are not immune to erosion of civilian control and the story of Britain tells us this. And of course, there is a general prescription, what to do. So, okay, Polina, we get it, what to do. And it's a prescription for policymakers, but also for scholars and practitioners to know your military. That's the central theme of this research. So where does this book fit on the bookshelf? You know, the usual books, who people who study governments, military, and the use of force, like to read. Uh, you recognize the covers, probably. And I hope that this project would, book project would contribute to exactly this collection of books. I build on research conducted by the scholars. I challenge and engage their assumptions. And uh, that's where military hopefully will find its place. So if you enjoyed reading or writing these books, I think my book will be of interest to you. Of course, a research of five years uh, generates not only one project, but other projects. Uh, there are two peer-reviewed publications I already mentioned, and if you're interested in those, you can find them online and knock on my door. I'm happy to talk about them. There is a forthcoming chapter that focuses on Ukrainian military's professional adaptation to Russian aggression uh, in the Handbook of Civil Military Relations, forthcoming. Uh, I have two manuscripts in preparation, and one of them is looking at civilian deference to the military in the United States when it comes to security assistance projects. Of course, this project is of high policy relevance, and there are at least two policy pieces that came out of it. First is that, I don't know if you can see it, but three days into the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, the public needed the explainer why mobilizing the volunteers in 2022 is different from what happened in 2014. It was a major trouble. And uh, I was able to provide a very brief explanation for the Washington Post. I have just finalized a report for the UK government on security sector governance in Ukraine and very hopeful to launch this report in the coming months. Thank you and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Polina. So uh, I'll take some questions. And because it's our first meeting of the year, if you can just give a one sentence you know, statement of who you are. Elizabeth Wood. Okay, Elizabeth Wood, faculty in history. Um, I love this paper. I'm curious to hear two things. One is, will you tell us what were your recommendations to the UK, UK government? Um, and the second is, as you know, that we had a major uprising in the military in Russia today, this summer, uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin and his Wagner troops. I'm um, curious how that fits into your thinking. All right, starting with questions. So, <laughs> go ahead. So, about. And two already breaking the <laughs> yeah, so about the UK government, I will be brief. Our main policy recommendation is to actually start a comprehensive policy assessment led by Ukrainian experts about the risks that the continuing use of force in Ukraine poses to the reforms. Ukraine is in a constant state of reforms, including those on civilian control. And Ukraine at the time lacks a comprehensive evaluation of how Russian war and its effect on reforms threaten civil control now and in the future. So comprehensive assessment, but led not even by people like me. I'm a native Ukrainian, but I sit here at MIT and I'm really glad to be here. But there are people on the ground who know better. About Prigozhin, surprisingly, we can learn more about 
civil military relations in Prigozhin's case from Ukraine than from Russia. Because this story is not new. Several years before, Ukraine had to turn to volunteer troops, pro-governmental militias, so-called, to substitute for the military who was not ready to fight in a fight. And Russia did exactly the same with Prigozhin's troops. But this story has different endings. When the Ukrainian government tried to subordinate the volunteer battalions to the Ministry of Defense, there was some very serious tension, but nothing looking like a coup in Ukraine. And in Russia, the situation is different. You know how it ended. Evgeny Prigozhin was likely killed by Putin in an airplane crash. And uh, my scholarship helps explain what was happening, but not why. Because it's still a mystery to me why Prigozhin did not copy the behavior of the Ukrainian volunteer battalions, and just did not sit in the base and wait for the troops to come and try to get him in. Uh, that would be an interesting encounter, but not about to happen. Barry. So um, I'm, I'm interested in, um, I guess, the the stickiness of the, the, um, the values, I guess, of the dependent variable models. So you've got insubordination, competition, and deference. And these are outcomes that are, happen within the case, right, in each individual country. Do you have a sense of how sticky this is after the contingency is over? In other words, does the experience leave its traces? Um, I remember once speaking to an American Secretary of Defense, who will go nameless, who after the transition of power to the next president, a different party, um, told, told me that civil control of the military was going away and it will take decades to get it back. So that person thought at that time that what was happening was extremely sticky and would have implications for a long time. I'm wondering if in your cases, do you have a way of tracking that, or is that like a future project, or do you see, I mean, just whatever you want to say about the question. Yeah, thank you so much. That's an interesting question. So when we talk about insubordination, that is a dynamic that mostly happens in time. So insubordination is not very sticky because it's a reaction to an event rather than a systematic reaction by the institution. The other two forms are sticky because the forms of competition, for example, given press statements by the generals, they can erode the norm of not doing this. So even when the independent variable is gone, that value of the dependent variable sticks, because what happened is not only the erosion of civilian control, but the erosion of what is normal and what is abnormal in the military's political behavior. And the most, uh, it's interesting that the best evidence that I have of that is actually in the case of the United States that I study for my Texas National Security Review. Uh, similarly, for deference, we remember the times we were having military secretary of defense was not something that we had in this country. And now look how it became a norm. While the drivers of Trump's deference to his generals are gone together with Trump, the norm was eroded. And uh, that's, that's what I see in some of my cases. The problem that in two of them, there is another conflict that conflates the causal identification. So the second intifada comes and shuffles the deck. The second Chechen war comes and it shuffles the deck. But at the same time, I can see even from evidence from these cases that yes, competition and deference, they become a norm. Insubordination is more reaction to a situation. Suzanne Freeman. The question is actually pretty similar to Barry's, but maybe it's more broad, which is like, it seems that this theory is very much a theory that rests on norms. And if we look at sort of the 1994 Russian case, they're saying we're not going to advance through civilians. It doesn't seem to be the way that the Russian military behaves anymore. Um, so is it simply that the military regulations changed and the Russian military immediately read them and changed their beliefs? Or is there something else that changed, that happened to sort of erode those norms in between? Thank you, Suzanne. What is and what is not a military profession has a number of more plastic components that can be changed over time pretty easily and a number of rather rigid components. And what I see in my case is often that it does take a military time to incorporate certain tasks as part of their military profession. However, there are 
components that again face stronger resistance. So we can see, for example, from the case of Israel, that yes, the Israeli military was ready to fight the second intifada, they had no issues with that. But at that time, the protest by civilians was not their issue. So the Israeli military resisted dispersing civilian protests as something that goes strictly against their profession, even when they agreed to fight against terrorists in the occupied territories uh, in the Second Intifada. Uh, similarly, uh, with the case of Ukraine, we see that the Ukrainian military was able to professionally adjust to the challenges on the battlefield. But that process happened only when the nature of the threat started to match their profession. So first, on August 24, 2014, the Russian troops crossed the Ukrainian border. That was undeniable. Before that, there was some plausible deniability. We were not sure, even though people who were on the battlefield, they were pretty sure that they're fighting against Russians already. But that's it. There is a moment of no denial. And from that point, Ukrainian military starts the professional adaptation. Before that point, they still had a question. Should we adjust our profession now to this? Or should the internal troops, the riot police, the security service of Ukraine actually come in and do their job? So it's a, it's a push and pull dynamics and it would be an interesting research question to test which components are more flexible and which are not. Eric. Uh, thanks for talking. I guess I have a question. Well, what can are you, you just say we were all out? Uh, the Eric Greenberg, I'm assistant professor in the department. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the strategy selection on the part of the military. So under what conditions do they decide to be insubordinate versus to, to compete? Um, and is this really a top-down story or a, a bottom-up story, right? Some of the cases you have fielded forces being the first to, to kind of resist, and others it's the, the top-down. Thank you, Eric. That's an amazing question. My current observation, and I would have to collect more evidence to test that empirically, that whether the military chooses insubordination or competition depends on the number of, on the degree of political power and social respect that the military enjoys in the country. So for Ukrainian leader, uh, military, competition was not much of a choice at the beginning. It was not a very prestigious institution. It did not enjoy the respect. And the best way to get themselves out of the operation was just to say, no, I will not implement this order. The military did not have a powerful political voice. But in Russia, several generals specifically before the beginning of the Chechen war, they earned some considerable social capital already due to other reasons. And they decided to ride on that capital to engage in competition. Similarly, in Israel, we see insubordination more among the reserve soldiers and new conscripts, but officers, they engage in competition because they have the, the weight of the uniform that actually gives them the stage to compete with the government. Let me feel a, a few questions, but a hands up for questions. Right, Ben, yeah, and then Chicago. Sorry, me. Yeah, you go ahead, right now. <clears throat> Hi, Wright Smith, a fifth year PhD student. So I had a question about the Ukraine case specifically. Mm -hmm. I'm curious. One of the things I think we know, I don't know the case as well as, as you or others in this room would, but my understanding is in 2014, there was still a very sizable number of essentially Russian sympathizers within the Ukrainian security establishment. And I'm curious, did that come up at all as a contributing factor to different units refusing to operate at the start of the war? Um, was this also a story of those people being pushed out of positions that the military changes tack? I'm curious how that fits in with the theory. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, this is definitely part of the story of the Ukrainian military, and it does not actually go, go against the professional explanation. When I interviewed the Ukrainian generals and also reviewed the interviews that were conducted at the times of the events by the media, there was a, an interesting theme. When we talk about the military profession, we're talking about the responsibility, expertise, and the sense of corporate spirit of the institution. And as the Ukrainian military viewed its mission or its responsibility, it's, it was still derived from the Cold War. So fighting Russians was not part of it. Russia has never been formally recognized as a threat to Ukraine. Uh, 
So it's true that the fact that troops underwent joint training or wore similar uniforms, the airborne troops, they had this uh, brotherhood of airborne guys. Between them, they wore the same uniforms. They were indistinguishable Russian and Ukrainian airborne troops. They were brothers. And then they had to fight. So yes, at the beginning, some of the people who belong to these units who are especially close to Russians said, no, 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 fighting Russians is not our job. We have to protect Ukraine from mm, the threat from the West. Seriously, some of the Ukrainian troops were still stationed according to the Cold War scheme, trying to protect Ukraine from Poland. I don't know. So uh, that's true. But it, it, it feeds nicely into this professional definition because they said it's not our mission. It's not our responsibility to fight with the Russians. That's an impossible scenario. And when I talked about the hindsight bias, that was one of those. When I asked uh, people I interviewed, did you know that it's actual Russians on the other side? They were like, yes, we knew all the time, of course. But when I look at the contemporary interviews, I see Ukrainian generals standing on one of the highs at the border between Russia and Ukraine saying, it's like, yes, I see the Russian troops shelling our positions, but I can't believe that they will cross the border. So even seeing Russian troops already shelling Ukrainian positions from the from not positions, but Ukrainian land from the Russian side, they still could not believe that Russians will cross the border and became their enemy on the battlefield. So yeah, right, thank you for this question. This is exactly how the Ukrainian military defined its profession. Fighting Russians was not part of their tasks at all. Uh, hello, I'm Ben, I'm also the fifth year. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, I'm curious on the theory side, how you operationalize risk for the government. Uh, it seems like almost all military operations are going to include some element of risk for the ruling party. So how do you decide if it does qualify as risky or not? Uh, and on that front, like, how do you control for the actual success of the operation? Because it seems if a military operation is very successful, there it becomes less risky for the government. You know, victory has many parents, but failure is an orphan. And so, like, how much of the story is like, oh, if a military operation fails, the civilian leaders are like, well, let's just put the the generals out there and let them take the fall for it. Yeah, I will, thank you, Ben, for the question. I will start uh, with the last part. Interestingly, in both Russia and the United Kingdom, the major cases of deference, uh, the government wanted to distance itself from policy making on the use of force even before the first boot of the soldier touched the ground. So it's not about the outcome of the operation as such. It's the fact that Yeltsin has to use the military in Chechnya that got him in trouble with Clinton. And we know it from the recently declassified memorandums of conversations between two presidents, which I enjoyed reading a lot. And we can talk about that separately. But so the outcome might affect it, but not in these cases. The government wanted out even before it got in. And uh, second is uh, risk to the government. It's a very tricky thing if you take your evidence seriously and if you take your theory seriously. I really wanted it to be sensitive to the context. For example, Israel has a coalition government. It means that a lot of political forces have to come together and form a majority in government. And putting such a government at risk would mean that one of the parties is threatening, threatening to get out of the coalition if the force is used. So that's an example of operationalization of that. In case of Russia, it was a little bit different because Russia was very dependent on US support at the time. And President Clinton telling Yeltsin that, Boris, you're in trouble, though OSCE is refusing to give you money because they don't believe that you're committed to reforms if you cannot solve Chechnya. It's another example of that. So coalition breakdown is one. Second, when elections are real and when public opinion matters, that's one of the one of the observable implications of the government being at risk. For example, in 1996, Yeltsin could not count on re-elections. He had to perform a number of acrobatic political tricks to even become a president in 1996. And that's clearly the government at risk of holding power. And I was able to trace the Chechen thread into that risk, showing that it's the government's policy on Chechnya that puts it in risk of re-election. So I have a lot of specific examples that makes this theory very tailorable to cases, but also not very high on the ladder of abstraction.
Kakuwaki, I'm a business scholar for the year. Um, thank you very much for your talk. It was uh, very interesting. And, um, I have a question. I want to focus a bit more on the insubordination part. And uh, you sort of already touched upon my question to the answers to the others. But I'm, I'm wondering, um, the evidence you shared with us, like uh, you know, the Russians saying, this is, we're not, it's not our role to use tanks against civilians, or we're not trained to do this. Um, then it sort of seems to me that was it the, the case that the, the government had actually implemented or ordered a policy which they actually didn't have uh, prior to ordering, meaning that if the military had had a doctrine, a training manual that actually trashed civilians, or uh, that they were part of the mission to either police or counterinsurgency in the first place, would that have not been the case of insubordination? So my, my question is, is it really, is it more the case that they did were not trained, they didn't have the mission stated either in the grand strategy, strategy, <coughs> doctrine, manuals, do you, how much would that be an explanation? And so in the future, if the, the government had already planned to implement these and institutionalize the military, uh, they will not insubordinate, or is it something else, the essence of the military that they have outside of these uh, uh, operational uh, procedures? Thank you. The best way of answering your question is with an example. An example and a prescription. So the essence of the question is like whether the military can be socialized into crushing civilians, or if it were part of their expertise, would they follow the order or not? And the case of the United Kingdom actually shows us, yes, when you train the military to deal with local civilians, they can disperse protests with banners in Arabic, but whatever. Uh, they can deal, they can negotiate, they can threaten, they can do curfews. It will not be successful in terms of the political outcomes, but they would follow the order. They, they would do whatever they're asked to and um, not challenge the government. But in practical terms, imagine that you're a government. You cannot become British from Russian overnight just because you want to, right? Uh, the best prescription for governments is to see if they want to use force as part of their domestic or foreign policy, actually, is to ask, OK, does our military do it? What is the mission closest to what we want to do? Like, consult with the military, ask, get to know their, their military, that's exactly this. And if your answer is no, I don't have forces, I don't have units, I don't have programs that address this particular kind of threat, maybe don't use force, use other means, that's first. Second, maybe invest in training forces for this particular kind of missions, because we see from the Ukrainian case and Israeli case and Russian case that the militaries can learn certain new tricks, but the job of socializing them into thinking that it's their job takes time and has to be done before you use force, not after. Because if you, if you do it the other way around, you will see insubordination and competition. Thank Thanks. you for your question. So I did have some other hands up. But OK, let's have Gabe, Jonathan, and is it Char Charlie yeah. OK. Yeah, you can go first. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's me. Yes. Go. Uh, uh, I'm James Kim. I'm a Senate fellow at SSP. Um, I'm, I have a question about um, either um, military or government learn from the historical experiences. You showed us cases of Russia and Ukraine. And do you see any influence of those past cases um, influence, um, on the current situations, especially the consequences of their past decisions? Um, or do you see as like more like each event as more independent um, events? Thank you, James. So as I meant, I, I will stand because I cannot see half of the audience and also not sure that you can hear me. So uh, as I told you, the work of five years cannot be easily translated into a 45 minute presentation. And this question talks exactly to the types of evidence that I did not present. So in Ukraine, we can see the interaction between different forms of erosion of civilian control that is very interesting. The initial military's insubordination left the vacuum. Who would fight the war? The rebels are still there, whether the military recognizes them as their job or not. And the government issued another policy to legalize the use of the volunteer battalions. Those guys were not professional. They had no professional limits on being involved in politics. And then they engaged in competition left and right. 
because they thought that their job is protecting Ukraine from the rebels, but also from corrupt politicians, but also like changing Ukraine to the best. They were very politically driven and motivated people. And the Ukrainian government learned from that experience because it was clearly problematic. And by 2022, it developed a reliable and very structured policy on how to mobilize the reserves, how to staff the territorial defense forces that replaced the volunteer battalions. And Ukraine did an amazing job in developing the legal basis, but also complexing these units on the ground so that when Russia attacked Ukraine again, uh, in February 2022, Ukraine was ready to use these new volunteers and to put them not in political battalions that were formed by political affiliations, but part of the Ukrainian armed forces and under the command of President Zelensky as the Supreme Commander-in-Chief. So that's the lesson that Ukraine learned bri brilliantly and an interesting part, because having this territorial defense forces is a very weird thing. Uh, Ukraine's uh, Western partners could not consult Ukraine on how to reform its military in that way. So that reform is an outcome of Ukrainian learning exclusively. Even though the Western resources financed the effort and supported people who were doing this, but the expertise comes from Ukraine and it proved to be successful. Thank e you. Eric. Hey, Polina. Uh, Eric Sand, assistant professor at the Naval War College. Thanks so much for your talk. I really love uh, everything about deference, I want to ask you a question about the, the professionalism side. It seems like you are, as you're describing professionalism in part about the nature of the work that the armed forces are trained to do. And I want to ask how much of that is also about the, whether the enemy is the expected enemy. You talked about how the Ukrainians didn't think the Russians were going to do. I'm going to do something a little unfair and give you a half out of sample case I want you to comment on about Ireland. Right? And I want to rewind to 1914 and the home rule crisis, right? And the British <laughs> army mutinies and refuses changes the government policy when they're in the midst of colonial policing everywhere else in the empire. But the target, right, is the English and the British, the not enemy? the Irish. So how much of this is about the expected enemy versus the expected task? Thank you so much, Eric. It's nice to see you here at MIT last time we met with Dr. Uh, it's an amazing question, and the incident in Northern Ireland is one of my favorite because people sometimes ask me, oh, maybe the British military is so subordinate because it's so democratic. The democratic institutions, you know, prevent it from getting into politics. And I'm like, oh my god, 1914. So what happened in 1914? The British military was deployed in Northern Ireland. And the order was to suppress and actually shoot fellow Brits then. And the commanding officers of the units who were supposed to implement this order said no and threatened the resignation. And then the officers one step higher above them said exactly the same. Soldiers staged a mutiny and it led to the collapse of the government of that policy. And that actually aligns with the policy focus theory nicely because they did not recognize as part of their job, even in the context of, continent, of uh, colonial counterinsurgency, to shoot at their own people. So it does have to do everything with the military profession, but the definition of who you're fighting against is part of the definition of your responsibility and expertise. Responsibility meaning who are you protecting country from and what kind of threats, and the expertise, what can you do to offer this protection? And the military is proved to be faster on learning the new expertise than adjusting their responsibility. So you're right, the story of who is the enemy is central and it resides directly inside of the definition of the military profession and not outside. Thanks for bringing up the kids. I, I always like to shed, shed, to cast shadow on the British democratic institution. <laughs> <laughs> Civilian control is just a lot of fun. Yeah, good job. Uh, John Carrigley, never walk off. Pleasure, great to see you. Um, super interesting. You said at the beginning that in pure state war, there's nothing about your argument that your theoretical argument that wouldn't apply to interstate war. But if you think, I mean, as we talked about, it's pretty clear that if you're fighting an external enemy, that's going to have an effect of both the professional uh, identity of the military and also what kind of risks are posed to the government. So if this was a quantitative analysis, like this wouldn't get past the referees if you didn't throw in the confounding factor of interstate war. I'm curious how you can do that in the book project. How are you going to address this problem? The fact that the type of war is going to influence both your causal paths. Thank you, John. Uh, I have two answers to it. Uh, 
uh, one is historical and another one is empirical. Uh, so historically speaking, uh, there, in, there is a number of cases in which the militaries identified interstate wars as not being part of their profession. And one of the examples is, of course, Israel in 1982, the first Lebanon war. The part of the Israeli military responsibility before that time was to fight the wars of no choice, the wars that threaten the Israeli survival, the wars that the Israel cannot afford to fight. Fighting in southern Lebanon in 1982 did not match that. And the Israeli military, that's when the movement of uh, conscient oh, oh my God, the selective refusal to serve was born, actually. The tendency originated there. It's just the scope was very different in the first intifada. So we see similar behavior of the same military in interstate conflict when it recognizes this war as being outside of their profession. They said, Israel military should not fight in wars it, cannot, it can avoid. And uh, that happened in 1982. The empirical answer is that I'm working on a paper now about why Russian soldiers are refusing to take orders and implement orders in the Russian invasion of Ukraine that is going on right now. And from the data I collected, it's extensive qualitative data. And I know that quantitative people don't necessarily believe in that, but um, I quoted uh, 165 cases observations in which uh, Russian soldiers said no to the orders they were given. And surprisingly, throughout the time, even though the nature of the Russian military changed, because it was more professional at the beginning and, well, less professional at this moment because of the battlefield losses and how those losses were filled, soldiers continue to bring up professional considerations. It's like, we were not trained for this kind of war. We don't have the equipment. We don't know what to do. And one of the reasons is because Russians trained their troops to fight in Syria and not in Ukraine. The large scale war that Russia decided to fight in Ukraine in 2022 was not part of the Russian military's expertise, even though it did not necessarily contradict the responsibility admission. But the expertise was not there and soldiers referred to the expertise. And of course, there is a number of biases in this kind of data. It's like, ha, huh, yes, they're, they're talking about the professional reasons and not moral reasons or the fact they're afraid to die and remain forever in the Ukrainian land. Uh, that's true, but some of the words they're using when talking to journalists and interviewers describing the Russian leadership and their commanders suggest that they're not really filtering <laughs> the message they're giving. There is a good reason to believe that professional considerations drive subordination by the Russian soldiers in Russia-Ukraine war, which is an inter interstate war. Still working on that paper and would be very grateful to your thoughts on that. Charles Glazer. Hi, I'm Charlie Glazer. I'm a senior fellow here at MIT, or returning to MIT. Um, so I have a, my questions are a little fussy, but I think that they matter because they influence your policy conclusions. So, like you, you say, weakening control, but in some ways, in, in the um, in the case of um, insubordination that you gave, it's really exposing. It's not that the policies weaken the control; it's that they ask the military to do something. Um, and then, then the military refuses. It's not weakening the control. It's the military, for reasons you've laid out, decides not to. So the, the implication is a little different then, and you've sort of answered it. So like, well, then if you want the military to listen, then you've got to train them in these ways, and then you'll have control. But it's not so much that the challenge itself weakens. It's the lack of preparation um, generates a subordination. Um, and also on, so that would be one, and on, also on deference, like to me, that doesn't seem like a problem of civilian control. The civilians give up their control voluntarily. Um, and so once again, it's not a civil military problem. It's a policy problem generated by the lack of guidance from the civilians. So both of those had sort of different logics underlining them, I think, and they're underlaying them, and then would lead to different policy suggestions. Thank you for these questions. So uh, I would appreciate an opportunity to talk to you about this further, because there is a lot going on there. Uh, from the causal perspective. I will address the last one because uh, about deference because it's easier. We used to think about erosion of civilian control. That's something that civilians cannot cause because it's not in their expertise. But even the alternative that you are giving goes in line with my theory. Yes, it's not about the military challenging. It's the policy weakening. It's the policy being ill-informed. That's exactly the central argument 
of my theory is that if you don't know what kind of a tool of statecraft you are holding, meaning the military, if you don't know how to use it, you cannot formulate policies that then will put you in control. And if we model civilian control as this uh, transmission belt between policy and the use of force, that's what I mean by erosion of civilian control. So bad policy prevents this transmission. And the fact that civilians delegated to the military voluntarily, it's not an alternative explanation. It's not a challenge. That's exactly the essence of my theory. Yes, civilians delegate this to the military, not to weaken civilian control. That's not the that's not the goal, but that's an unintended consequence. And that's why we remained blind to this kind of erosion of civilian control so long, because we model it as an intentional action by the insubordinate agent of a principal who is interested in holding the wheel. Uh, I would appreciate continuing this conversation because I think there is a lot of important things that I could clarify in my theory and argument by talking to you. Thank you. I want to switch gears just a little bit in the last uh, 10, 10, 15 minutes we have. Because one, I was on Polina's dissertation committee, and one of these things are how much, how much do these insights travel, and what are the things maybe Polina hasn't thought about that are really important insights that, that we have towards civil uh, military relations. So we have, what, five or six colonels, lieutenant colonels of U.S. military in the room? And you don't get to sit on your hands when you come to these things, by the way. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Listening to Polina, Polina says when civilian policies challenge the, what you think is the, your profession as military officers, then there's at least some motivation to be insubordinate or maybe have a competing view. Um, and the other, when the politicians, they don't know what to do, so they just throw it on to, on to the military guys. So. Uh, I know you, you can't really speak badly here about your, your um, in, but what, on the record. what do you have from the U.S. military side on this? Or are the norms just so strong that it's just like you're, you know, yes, sir, civilians, you don't know what you're doing. Yes, Marcus. So I actually have a question. Uh, in the case study, uh, Marcus Gillette, uh, Marine Corps uh, military officer, what is the military's culture and responsibility in generating a situation in which that is the only recourse? Um, is it the structure of the institution? Uh, you, you mentioned the social aspects of it and the, the credibility of the military. Um, but in these case studies specifically, is it a weak institution that, that my only recourse is insubordination um, or competition uh, that drove these particular uh, incidents, items uh, in history? It's a great question. And with institutions, it's my favorite alternative explanation. That's why I have peace from that. I don't know who to call the IDF a weak institution. It definitely is not. It's very powerful. And still, it had to resort to insubordination and competition to uh, get itself out of the first intifada. It was not successful, by the way. We all know that. And uh, the Israeli military continued fighting in that conflict. There are several pathologies of policy making that could lead to this. And one of them, surprisingly, follows directly from the Huntingtonian prescription of separating the autonomous military profession from policy. To what degree do you actually separate it? You should not separate the information flows. How would you know your military if you're not talking to them? The same issue is with the uh, civil military relations literature that codes uh, civilian um, preference, uh, the dominance of civilian preference over the military preference as good civilian control. It's like, yes, you dominated. You decided to start a war without actually asking your military whether it can fight it, and you get yourself into trouble. So I think that the lack of institutionalized, clear, and safe channels of communication between civilians and their militaries is part of the story. And the story is nicely told in Elliot Cohen's Supreme Command about the nitty gritty of interaction between civilian leaders and their generals. Uh, and I think that's what's missing. It's not the weak institution of the military. It might be actually the weak institution of the government, not the government as self, but the absence of an agency or working group or a point person who would be responsible to bridging this gap and 
actually informing the governments on what their military is supposed to do and help them to know their militaries. Yeah, Barry. It obviously is a big project and we've got a lot of moving parts, so I'm perfectly prepared to believe that I missed something. So I, I just want to talk about a little thing that's confusing me. Um, so in these three outcomes, insubordination, competition, and deference, insubordination and competition are things that the military does. Deference is a thing that the, the civilians do. And these are, as we talked about earlier, characteristics of the case. So you're looking at the case and you're saying, I have a cluster of activities that look like this. But here's my question, right? How many different old things can a military do when the civilians are deferring to them and they don't want to be deferred to? So insubordination could be a result of deference, right? Um, competition could be a result of deference. But one can imagine other things that are missing from the story in this situation. So there could be some sort of goal displacement, right, where I tell the American military, um, go ye forth and slay the um, Al-Qaeda people who are living in Afghanistan. And they do the best they can, and they look up, and there's still lots of trouble in Afghanistan. They're not really Al-Qaeda people anymore, right? It's a different enemy. So there's this kind of switch to the Taliban as your enemy, right? And the war goes on, and everyone else just accepts that. No one kind of remembers, well, wait a second. Taliban's kind of, they were enablers of your enemy, but that's not the way this all started, right? So you could you could displace, right? You could also kind of um, uh, obscure, which is, you know, sort of, so Rachel Teacott has a whole dissertation on, go ye forth and create professional working militaries of great mm -hmm. competence. I have to believe in looking at the thesis, the thesis and looking at over time, they know they're not achieving that. They know for sure they're not achieving that. So they invent a bunch of metrics that kind of suggest something's happening, and then they kind of leave it at that. Let's just hope that nobody bothers us to look too carefully at this. So the, the question I'm, I'm asking is, 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 have you thought about an array of responses to the deference problem? I asked you earlier about the stickiness mm -hmm. of deference, i.e., can you get authority back after you've deferred to this large institution? But there's another thing the military can do. We don't want a part of this, but we're not going to be visibly insubordinate, right? That's just not the way they are. But there's something else that happens, a kind of a kind of work to rule, a strike, or something. So I'm just wondering about mm -hmm. that. Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. And I'm a big fan of Rachel's uh, work specifically for that reason, because she looks at a major case of deference. Just go build someone else's military with no guidance. It's what nicely resonates <coughs> with my case. So my book shows that there is an interaction between different forms of the road. In one case, as I mentioned, Ukrainian military's insubordination led to the creation of this new actor, volunteer battalions, that competed. But uh, when we talk about reactions to deference, there are two ways, uh, two, two forms of deference. One originating from reference divergence, where the military does not want to formulate policy, the, the, the government doesn't want to formulate policy and the military doesn't want to either. But they're trained to say yes, so they pretend to kind of do something. Uh, the main point, they can fail, they can formulate bad policy, they can provide reports that are faulty, but the main point of deference is that the government is out of it. So one of the ways the military can resist deference, if there is a diversion, preference is to kind of do their job but not really it's like an Italian strike kind of situation um, the second like I do exactly what you ask me to but not more than that and it looks nice on paper uh, but there is a second issue when deference does not involve diverging preferences when the military kind of doesn't mind actually doing the job and we see it in Israel but civilians still exploit the military who doesn't mind doing the job to shield themselves from the political consequences of risky steps, for example, deciding on which territories to give up to Palestinians. That's a risky step for the uh, Israeli government. And uh, what the military can do then, yes, it can lead to some degree of, um, it, can, um, it can result in political behavior that could be coded as competition, 
if it were against the government policy. So, for example, in uh, Northern Ireland, the military resisted deference by constantly asking for policy guidance, but then just saying, you know what, we're done with it. We're doing what we were trained for. We'll decide the policy on the ground. And if you don't know the context, you can look at it like, oh, so they're doing competition in reaction to deference. But competition has to be directed at government's policy. And in the absence of government's policy, it's not even a competition. It's the military assuming a political role and formulating policy on the ground. So this interaction between different forms of uh, erosion of civil and control constitutes a very complex phenomenon that the book's, book talks to partially, but it deserves a separate research project on that. I would actually like to talk to you about this. It's an interesting question. Let me just pick up on Barry's question a little bit with con something concrete, because I know some of the officers in here served in Iraq. You got asked to do building schools and t sewer systems, and this isn't really the core profession that you were trained to do. And it seemed that the political leadership at the time would, would rather have the military do it than have the State Department or some civilians do it. Um, but did you have any, like, hey, that's just not, or you just had to follow it? Or what, what pushback can you even give? Like, hey, maybe you should get the State Department more, or get more PRT teams, or us the Iraqis' business and not ours, or that just isn't, wasn't part of the, the game? We did that to ourselves, in my own opinion. Uh, as, a, as a Department of Defense, uh, and there's good reason for it as, as the conflict evolved, but uh, if you look at budgets, if you look at resource allocation within the interdepartmental aspect of the U.S. government, uh, tools such as the Department of State are grossly underfunded while the DOD receives a, a, a mammoth amount of that because we've assumed all these missions um, that we're not, maybe not the best for. And that's, that is, to some extent, become the norm. Uh, I view it as, as uh, something that needs to change, especially as we move to, from counterinsurgency to great power competition. Uh, because if I look at every problem as a nail and it should be solved with a hammer, um, that's, not, that's not integrated deterrence, it's not integrated competing, uh, it can be counterproductive with the best of intentions. Um, that's my opinion. I have a few Well, I, I should say it's interesting um, because, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, we're not the only town. So the, um, portion where what we do is we bring mass in an organized fashion better than some of our colleagues uh, across the, you know, to your point, right? So uh, when we brought the Afghan guests back over when they were evacuating Afghanistan, I was a part of that. So I should say, I'm Kristen DeWild, I'm an uh, Air Force officer, uh, physician by background. So um, there is no portion that says, hey, you will go build a refugee camp for lack of a better term. Um, and staff that and but who else was going to do it? right at that juncture in time HHS wasn't qualified like there wasn't there was there just wasn't enough and so who did they tap they tap the American military because we can show up and in an organized fashion get that get that job done despite the fact of not being trained thank you sharing your experiences uh, my two finger on the earlier comment was that how the U.S. military became the hammer that has to hit all nails is part of the story. I like to talk about British government. I also like to talk about Huntington. Uh, when we emphasize military autonomy, that's what we get. When the military wants as little civilian meddling as possible, unfortunately, it has to take on civilian functions. And that's what happens. And, and that's why I urge my colleagues as scholars, but also policymakers, to adopt more complex solutions to civilian control of the military than simply uh, civilians do policy, military break things. Because then you, I ask the military to build things. It's like, OK, but keep your civilians out of me building things. And now we have the military and the Department of Defense that has an outsized budget and also is building refugee camps in Afghanistan or Iraq. So, yeah, if you have your Huntington complaints, please knock on my door. <laughs> All right, we're out of time, so let's thank our speaker.